Hey everyone, my name is Kaylee and I am a museum fellow here at the Wild Center. For this week's Nature Lab, we're going to be talking about wetland botany. I'm going to be using a few different terms to talk about different types of wetlands today. So I'll briefly go over them and then we can go ahead and get exploring. The term wetland refers to an area where the soil is covered in water for periods of time throughout the year, particularly during the growing season. Wetlands support both terrestrial and aquatic life. Bogs, swamps, marshes, and fens are all different types of wetlands. A bog is a wetland that is high in acidity, low in nutrients, and often supports peat, fungi, and a wide variety of mosses. A swamp is a forested wetland, and a fen uh, is a peat forming wetland that relies on groundwater. A marsh is an area of low lying land that floods during the wet seasons or high tides and typically remains waterlogged all the time. Alright, got all those? Then let's get exploring and go find some plants. The first plant uh, that I'm going to be talking about today is the pitcher plant. So pitcher plants um, have come up with a way to successfully exist in bogs, which are notoriously low in their nitrogen and other available nutrients uh, that they have in their soil due to the nature and the wetness of the actual wetland. The pitcher plant has adapted to this hardship by being carnivorous. The bright red outer lip of this plant attracts insects who mistake the bright colors for a flower full of nectar. The insects follow the tube downward. The plant's inner walls are lined with downward facing hair, which makes climbing out extremely difficult. Eventually, most insects succumb and fall into the water at the bottom of the pitcher, where they are digested by an acidic enzyme that completely dissolves them. Pitcher plants can be found in wetlands along both the west and east coasts, as well as throughout northern states like New York and Maine, the Great Lakes region, and across much of Canada, from British Columbia to Labrador and Newfoundland. Next up, we're talking orchids. Orchids are the second largest family in the world, uh, second only to asters. There are around 25,000 known species of orchids throughout the world, spanning almost every biome. Mountains, wetlands, farmlands, grasslands, beaches, and even along rocky Canadian shield. They are one of the most diverse plant families in the world. Of those 25,000 species, there are 207 known species of orchids in the United States. And of those 207, there are 60 that are native in New York. In the spirit of wetland botany, I'm going to be talking about a few of those species that are adapted to life in a marsh. Orchids growing in marshes endure a large amount of fluctuating levels of water and poor soil conditions. To combat soil with low amounts of available nutrients, orchids have developed what is called a symbiotic relationship with soil microbes. A symbiotic relationship is one that occurs in nature between two organisms where at least one of the organisms benefits from the relationship. The three main types are mutualism, commensalism, and parasitism. Mutualism is when both organisms benefit from the relationship. Commensalism is when one organism benefits and the other one isn't really affected. And parasitism is where one organism benefits and the other is harmed. The mutually beneficial relationship that orchids have with the soil microbes basically um, allow an exchange of nutrients that the orchids wouldn't otherwise be able to get from the soil, but the microbes can. So they create those nutrients um, and then feed them into the orchid. And in response, they get nutrients that they wouldn't be able to get from the atmosphere from the orchid. In this way, uh, this is a mutually beneficial relationship where the soil microbes are getting some stuff that they wouldn't get otherwise, and the orchids are actually able to grow in these low nutrient lands. Next, I'm gonna talk a little bit about the black spruce, also known as the bog or swamp spruce. Spruces are a genus of trees that occurs within the pine family um, which also includes like firs, cedars, and pine trees. You can distinguish spruces from other members of the pine family in a variety of ways, but I think the easiest is by their cones and their needles. Spruce needles uh, will grow singularly off the branch, as you can see here. And then if you look closer at the needles, it's a little hard in this video, but if you're looking at one, actually it's easier to see. Um, if you look at them straight on, they're gonna be square shaped. So if you're looking at a fir tree, uh, fir needles also grow straight off the branch, but these ones, when you look closer at the needles, they're flat. So spruce is square and then fir is flat. That's kind of a, <laughs> an easier way to remember that. Uh, spruce needles 
Um, like I said earlier, spruce needles also grow singularly off the branch. And a way to tell those from pines are that pines have these things, they're called fascicles, and they're essentially little bundles. So pine trees have bundles of needles that grow um, in either groups of five or groups of two or three, depending on the species of pine. The cones of spruces have papery scales. Um, it's a little hard to see on this one because it's closed, uh, but since the time of the year, I was having a difficult time finding an open one. But you can see the scales are sort of papery and they're flat. Um, also, the shape of it is very thin and long, um, and they feel and look a lot more fragile than other species. Pine trees uh, will have bigger scales, and then often on pine trees, they'll have sort of little spurs on the end of the scales. Firs are going to have cones that grow erect, and they stick up instead of hanging down. Firs also don't keep their cones year-round, and when they drop, um, the cones sort of like explode or disintegrate, um, so you don't usually see them on the ground. Black spruce occurs mostly in wet soils, including bogs and swamps, but it can also be found on mountain slopes. Uh, it gets its name from the dark appearance that its uh, needles will get when it's growing in dry areas, which is typically like mountainsides. Um, but usually in the Adirondacks, you would find it growing in swamps and bogs, so it doesn't have that same dark appearance. Uh, so it's still called the black spruce, but it'll look a little different from other places. Um, black spruce that grow in bogs generally appear stunted, and that's going to be due to the readily available lack, or the lack of readily available nutrients. Or often if you see a stand of black spruce, um, the ones that you see growing inside the bog will be small and stunted and like gnarly looking, whereas the ones around the outskirts of the bog will be nicer and bigger, and they're going to be tall and narrow. The reason for this is the ones that are growing actually in the bog, uh, the conditions are a lot wetter, so it's harder for the tree to take root and grow large, whereas on the outskirts it's a bit drier, so it can grow taller easier. Black spruce usually have shallow roots, and that allows them to optimize uh, the amount of nutrients they're getting out of the ground. They prefer to live in acidic soils, but are super tolerant of high pH in soils and waters, and that's what allows them to live in bogs. All right. I hope that everyone enjoyed uh, talking about just a few of the many ways plants survive tough ecological conditions. If you'd like to practice looking for plant adaptations and inferring how these adaptations help them survive in tough ecological conditions, uh, check out the supplemental worksheet for this New to Nature Lab. Anyways, uh, have a good rest of your day and I'll see you next time.